What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, and don't forget to leave a comment. I always try to get back to everybody. So you can see from the thumbnail, top five ways that people die in prison. Hmm. What are you thinking right now? How do people die? Probably think gang violence, stabbings, killings, right? I mean, that's one of the top fives. But the number one reason and way that people die in prison, from my perspective, from the things that I've seen, is always over alcohol. There's always an issue. You get drunk, you know what happens? Somebody always gets killed, man. I promise you that. I'm just going to talk a little bit about things that happened, you know, back in the day. Talk about things that are relevant, things that I've seen. And one of the ways to die is getting drunk in prison. Getting drunk in prison always leads to bad things, man. So we're going to talk a little bit about the riot at Florence. Some of you guys might know the riot at Florence. This is in April 2008 on Hitler's birthday. A bunch of white dudes are out on the yard getting drunk. Things go bad. But let me read you a little bit about it. The state lawmakers who represent Florence said guards in three towers at the maximum security prison fired every round of lethal and non-lethal ammunition at their disposal Sunday to quell the melee that erupted when a white supremacist prison gang taunted African-American inmates on Adolf Hitler's birthday. Two inmates who died were shot by guards, said State Rep. Buffy McFadden. McFadden said she had been told by correctional officers that the riot at the United States Penitentiary in Florence erupted at about 12.30 p.m. Sunday when the white supremacists began yelling slurs toward African-Americans and a fight ensued. The two inmates who were killed were shot after refusing to follow repeated orders from correctional officers and were fired upon only as a last resort, said McFadden. The spokesman for the Florence prison, Leanne LaRivia, confirmed in a release today that the guards did fire on inmates and she identified the two inmates killed as Brian Scott Kubiak and Philip Lee Hooker. Kubiak 40 was serving a 15-year sentence after being convicted in federal court in Oregon as an ex-felon in possession of a firearm. 15-year sentence, and now he's dead. Hooker, 41, was serving a 25-year sentence for armed robbery on charges out of Milwaukee. Kubiak was white, and Hooker was black. Lariva said the riot involving 150 to 200 inmates was racially motivated. She said inmates were armed with homemade weapons, including rocks, sharpened metal, plastic, and wood. McFadden said that the correction officer repeatedly fired what are called no-man rounds. Warning shots into the yard away from human targets. The intent is to scare and warn, not to hit a target, she said. Lariva said the guards verbally warned the inmates to settle down, then fired a tactical distraction round before using lethal force. The quick and effective response by staff prevented further loss of life, she said in the news release. Jeff Dorsher, spokesman for the United States Attorney's Office in Denver, said the FBI's Denver-based evidence response team is currently going through the recreation yard where the riot erupted, collecting evidence. He said the FBI is working with the U.S. Bureau of Prisons investigators to determine what happened. We already know what happened. There was a race riot. I think my boy wrote this. Brandon Sample wrote this in Criminal Legal News while he was a federal prisoner. He went on to get out of prison and become a lawyer. So let me finish. In a statement released last night, Lervia said five inmates were taken to a local hospital for treatment. There was no further word on their condition. McFadden said at the height of the riot, the total federal prison campus was on lockdown with officers from the other three prisons on the four prison campuses being called in to quell the riot. The other three prisons included the U.S. Penitentiary Maximum Facility, or Supermax, the Medium Security Federal Correctional Institution, and a Minimum Security Camp. McFadden has reportedly warned, repeatedly warned, that the U.S. Penitentiary, where the riot occurred, was about to blow. Early last year, Ken Chateau, the Guard Union leader, and McFadden held a news conference warning of the danger. Chateau said that in February 2007, tower guards were forced to fire lethal and non-lethal rounds to stop inmates from killing one another. Today I'm trying to head off full-blown riots, Chateau said. That's where I think we are headed. McFadden said today that although Supermax receives more publicity, the U.S. penitentiary is extremely dangerous because of the domestic gangs there. She said the gangs such as the white supremacist gang are very organized and that many of their members are doing life without an opportunity for parole. So these dudes get drunk on the yard. There's some racial tension. They start talking shit. The other group starts talking shit back. And what happens? 
Riot breaks out, 150 to 200 people, and they say the guards responded and they took care of business and they prevented further loss of life. They came in a timely fashion. You don't believe that, do you? I've been there. I'm telling you, they don't come in a timely fashion. <clears throat> I've seen it time and time again. Dudes get drunk and they end up dead. USP Lee. Dude gets drunk, starts faking. I might have talked about this before. Tells a dude from D.C., he says, hey, look, man, pretty much, man, you're full of shit. And the D.C. dude says, hey, man, you better be easy, man. And the Virginia dude's drunk. He stands up from the poker table, pulls up his shirt and says, I'll put that knife in you. You know, you see dudes in movies right here on the street. They pull up that shirt like they got a gun in their waist or a lot of times they do. So I'm like, if you get out of line, this is what I got for you. Federal prison, man. Killing field. So dude lifts up his shirt. The problem with him is he doesn't have a knife and he's drunk. Virginia guy, guy out of Virginia. Antonio, some of you guys might know him if you're watching the video. He's from D.C. He's sitting at the poker table. He's running the poker table. He's drinking a little bit. Dude from Virginia's all the way drunk. Homemade wine, moonshine. And Antonio jumps up. He starts stabbing him. And the dude's screaming, man, don't kill me, man, don't kill me. And Antonio he utters the words, it's too late for that. And he keeps stabbing, man. And the blood's all black. That's when I knew dude was dead, man. It was over, man. He killed this dude, man. His life was gone. He said, please don't kill me. It's too late for that. Drunk, man. Getting drunk in prison is the number one way to die in prison, at least in the prisons that I've been in. I've seen people brutalized, man. Got another one for you. It's a dude from Florida. His name was Wiz. He's got dreads. Keeps a knife inside his hair. He's beefing with a D.C. kid. Jamaican dude. They're beefing on the poker table, getting drunk. I believe it was Christmas Eve. I'm at the microwave. USP Lee. Check it out. Christmas Eve. I'm up at the microwave frying up some food, putting some stuff together for me and the homies. And I hear... <laughs> if you hear that sneaker hitting the ground... You know what it is. That's the first thing you hear, man, in the unit when people are starting to fight. You hear the sneaker squeaking on the ground. And I look over and I see these dudes battling. The dude with the dreads is kind of getting pieced up, man, by the little skinny dude from D.C. Little black dude, man. He was a Jamaican kid missing his front tooth. Can't remember. Can't remember his name. They're in there fighting. Kids piecing them up. Jamaican dude's drunk. The dude whiz from Florida, he's drunk. He shakes his hair and he pulls out a knife. He's got a knife hidden in his dreads. His dreads are all up. He's got that knife in his dreads. He pulls it out. He starts chasing the dude. Dude runs, trips, stumbles. And all of a sudden, his homeboy, his celly, comes running out of the cell. The Jamaican dude, celly, he's from D.C. Little dude, man, named Cellboy. Cellboy comes running out of the cell. He pulls out a knife. Badass knife. A knife that's made out of the vents. In federal prison, we got these vents. And in them, you can move them. And how this dude got a piece of this, I don't know. But he's got that metal thing that we can move. It's sharpened to a point. And right when this dude, Wiz, is getting ready to get on that Jamaican kid, on the ground, the kid fell now. He's looking up. Tried to throw a chair at him, tried to get away. He's looking up. And dude's got the knife, and all of a sudden, cell boy hits him. It's like something out of the Matrix, man. But remember, they're all drunk. Slides across the floor and starts just blazing this kid. The kid whiz, blazing him. Stabs the shit out of him. And at the time, I had a celly, man. I tried to bring him on the show. I'm hoping that he'll listen to this and come on. I had a celly named Tim Tim. And we're going to talk about Tim Tim in this incident in a minute. So anyway, cell boy just stabs the hell out of this dude, man. Police come in. They end up breaking up the shit. Cell boy gets away. Cell boy don't go to the hole, but his celly goes to the hole. Boo. I've been with Boo in almost every single prison I ever been to. A little short dude from D.C. had like 25, 30 years. He was always getting drunk, trying to numb the pain. Boo goes to the hole, but Cell Boy stays behind. So now there's a beef. The Florida dudes against the D.C. dudes. They end up going outside. They're politicking. My, you know, my Selly Tim Tim, he's out there. He's a little white kid from D.C. Him and Cell Boy are real, real close. He's out there with Cell Boy. He ends up throwing a hot cup of coffee on one of the Florida dudes in their face. Eventually, everything gets settled. 
There's a little battle out there. People come in, they round up dudes, they take dudes to the hole. But the moral is, man, getting drunk in prison, man, is the number one way to die. You're getting drunk in prison. And anybody watching this video, tune in, man. Former prisoners, former cops. Let's tell them how it is, man. Let's keep it 100. It's real and it's raw. People are making moonshine in prison. What they do is they make this wine and then three, four days later, they shine it off their electric box in their cell. They shine it up. It's like vodka. They get blasted, man. Other dudes just make wine and they drink wine. I've seen Indian dude, seen them massacred, getting drunk, Native Americans, stabbing their own people. Wine is the number way, number one way to die in prison, if you ask me. If anybody disagrees, man, hit that comment section. Let me know. Number two. Number two. What is number two? Think about it. What do you think number two is, man? Is it gangs? Could be, right? Could be gangs. Could be your own celly. We'll talk a little bit about gangs, man. Let's talk about gangs. Because I think being in a gang or being in the wrong gang is the number two way that you die in prison, man. You know, I talk a lot about Big Sandy, so I'm going to read this about Big Sandy. Defendants Gravely, Daryl Milburn, and Deron Crawford were once all inmates at USP Big Sandy in Inez, Kentucky, a federal penitentiary. They shared a cell in Big Sandy special housing unit. They're in the shoe, man. Think about this. They're in the shoe. One, two, three dudes in the shoe. On November 12, 2006, an officer came to the shoe to ask Gravely and Milburn if another inmate, Shimoni Peterson, could be placed in their cell. <clears throat> According to Crawford, Gravely consented to the request, but then said to Milburn, we're going to eat his food, which Crawford understood to mean that they were going to physically harm Peterson. Crawford would testify at Gravely's trial that soon after Peterson was placed in the cell, Gravely and Milburn assaulted and killed him. According to Crawford, Milburn put a t-shirt in Peterson's mouth and cupped a hand over his face to suffocate him. While Gravely stood watching, Crawford made no attempt to assist Peterson for fear he would be attacked next, but afterwards did help Gravely and Milburn remove evidence from the scene. Crawford also testified that Gravely asked Crawford to cut Milburn's hands with a razor blade to make it look like Milburn had acted in self-defense. The following morning, Shimoni Peterson was found dead in the cell. A medical examiner observed that Peterson had sustained several injuries inflicted through blunt force trauma and concluded that the cause of death was asphyxia where the mouth area had been forcibly covered. After prison officials discovered Peterson's body, they immediately separated Crawford, Gravely, and Milburn and questioned Crawford, who told officers what he had witnessed. Gravely was eventually transferred to a facility in Manchester, Kentucky. At Gravely's trial, multiple former inmates testified against him. David Johnson, a big Sandy inmate, and orderly testified that Gravely had admitted on several occasions and in several conversations that Gravely and Milburn had attacked Peterson. Johnson also testified that both Gravely and Mil Milburn were members of the Bloods gang, and that Gravely, who was a senior to Milburn in the gang, had ordered Milburn to attack Peterson and to take responsibility for the attack. In exchange, Milburn was to get rank in the gang and be paid as much as $60,000. Andre Player, another federal inmate, testified that Gravely boasted about having been the most senior member of the Bloods gang at Big Sandy, describing himself as the head guy, saying that a gang-related murder had happened in his cell there and claiming to have orchestrated the murder. Player recalled that the name of the murdered inmate was Peterson upon hearing his name from Gravely and also recalled Gravely mentioning the name Milburn. Inmates Corey Thomas and Paul Woods testified that Gravely allegedly told them that in retaliation against Peterson for his alleged statements against the Bloods, Gravely ordered Milburn to assault Peterson. Woods also testified that Gravely told him that Crawford, the third inmate, participated in the assault by kicking Peterson. On April 1st, 2011, a jury found Gravely guilty on all charges, and he was sentenced to life in prison on September 8th, 2011. It's a little bit about one gang, right? How many people died right there? You think it was just the guy they took out in the body bag? Nah. How about the dudes that killed them dudes? They died. They died that day. Because now what are they? They're dead men walking. I've talked plenty about the SAC gang, I don't want to keep talking about Ricky Fackrell and Kramer, but you guys have seen those pictures, right? We've been there. We've seen what that gang did to their own people, right? 
don't want people to get mad because I've got some pretty nasty emails over that video. But I mean, this is the truth, man. This is the this is what happens. These things happen in these places. You're involved in a gang. It could get ugly, man. It could definitely get ugly. It could definitely get ugly in prison. Um, there was another thing that just recently happened at USP Lee. I want to see if I can find this. I actually had the indictment. Um, and I read the indictment the other day when I was preparing to do this video. I want to see if I can find it. Um, Mexican mafia member murdered at USP Lee. What do you think is going to happen? You think that's going to set some things off? That was actually the MS-13 against the MA, I guess, right? Let me read some of this to you because this is just like, this is wow, okay? The defendants Julio Chavez and German Hernandez are charged by indictment with conspiracy, with conspiring to commit murder in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1117 and attempting to commit murder. The defendants have filed motions to suppress statements made to prison officers on January 21st, 2020. This is recent. As a part of an investigation into stabbing that occurred on January 15th, 2020 at USP Lee. USP Lee, a prison that I have been to. A prison that I had talked about before. Um, a prison that I was at with, you know, Fox and a bunch of the Southsiders. Really, when they got there, man, that became their prison. That was their yard. So I'm going to read some more of this. The defendants are currently incarcerated at USP Lee. On January 15, 2020, the defendants and three other co-defendants charged in the indictment were involved in the stabbing of another inmate that was captured on the prison security video system. Right there. They got video cameras everywhere, man. How the hell are you going to get away with that? Or maybe you got life. Maybe you don't care. Agent Canfield suspected that the incident was gang-related. Both defendants are members of Mara Salvatrucha 13, also known as MS-13. And the victim is a member of the Mexican Mafia, another prison gang. Shortly after the incident, other fights broke out throughout the facility between MS-13 members and the Serenios, a gang that is an ally to the Mexican Mafia. MS-13 usually pledges allegiance to the Mexican Mafia, and the Serenios are considered the foot soldiers of the Mexican Mafia. Following the incidents, USP Lee went into facility-wide lockdown as is the standard protocol following such matters. Identified members of the gangs were relocated to separate housing units. MS-13 members were specifically relocated into a single housing unit within the facility, the G housing unit. During lockdown, all the USP Lee inmates were confined to their cells. If inmates had to leave their cell for any reason, they were escorted with their hands and restraints behind their backs. This is your life right here, man. This is the life you live in prison. <coughs> Excuse me. The SIS unit at USP Lee immediately launched an investigation regarding whether there was a larger dispute between the three gangs. MS-13, the Mexican Mafia, and the Serenios. Canfield was concerned that the accord between MS-13 and the Mexican Mafia had ended and that more violence was possible. At the same time, similar investigations were being conducted through the Bureau of Prisons as they were concerned that the prison gang's dispute extended beyond USP Lee. So they were thinking this thing's going to pop off everywhere, right? The SIS is tasked with investigating security incidents that occur at the facility. During the SI investigation, a total of 36 inmates were interviewed, including all known MS-13 members. Canfield and SIS technician Paul Necessary conducted the MS-13 interviews, with SIS Lieutenant Corey Davis coming in and out of the interviews. Canfield and Necessary were both wearing standard correctional officer gear, including handcuff keys, radio, pepper spray, but neither individual carried a firearm. You know, they're explaining all that because they're arguing about suppressing statements here. And they're saying, hey, look, they didn't, you know, overexert their authority. These guys freely gave these statements. So let's talk about that. Agent Canfield interviewed Defendant Chavez on January 21st, 2020 at approximately 9.45 a.m. And Defendant Hernandez on the same day at approximately 11.30 a.m. Canfield did not advise the defendants of their Miranda warnings. It's all good. In his interview, Defendant Chavez stated, we have tried to fix the disrespect issues from Zaragoza, the stabbing victim. But no one wanted to hear it and didn't want to change it, so we fixed it. We have crossed a line that can't go back. We know what we did. This is how it needed to be. When asked if MS-13 would have attacked any member of the Mexican Mafia, he stated, any of them that got in the way. The inmate investigative report also attributed paraphrased statements to Defendant Chavez. 
MS-13, quote unquote, no longer wanted to associate with the Mexican mafia or Serenos, Sereno inmates, and they wished to stand as their own group. They would walk any yard regardless of who else was on the yard, but they, MS, would strike first, regardless of the numbers or the consequences. And he did not feel there was any way to fix this issue, nor did he express any desire to fix the issue between the groups. The same paraphrase statement also attributed to, a def to Defendant Hernandez. MS-13 no longer wanted to associate with the Mexican Mafia or Sereno inmates, and they wished to stand as their own group. They would walk any yard regardless of who else was on the yard, but they, MS, would strike first regardless of numbers or consequences. And he did not feel there was any way to fix this issue, nor did he dis express any desire to fix the issue between the groups. I mean, think about that. You know, groups, gangs, organizations, whatever we might call them. There's always a way, no matter who you are, you could be the big homie, man. And, you know, someone like the MS-13 can say, you know what, we're tired of it. We're tired of it. We're about to kill this dude. We don't care what rank he has. We're going to kill him. And that's what these dudes did, man. They went ahead and killed this cat. And what do you think happens after they kill him? You know what happens. Shit gets real. I don't care what gang you're in. You know, some gangs are more ruthless than others. Some gangs have more issues than other gangs. Some cars, some groups. You know, some are more dangerous. Some create their own problems. But at the end of the day, joining a gang in prison, I believe, is the number two way that you can die in prison. It's the number two way where your blood could be left on the razor wire. Do you want to be that dude? You want to be that dude in that gang where you got that rank and you've been in prison 10, 15, 20 years. You've been going hard. You've been putting in work. And all of a sudden there's a young lion. And that young lion wants the old lion's position. And he decides, you know what? I don't give a shit. I'm about to kill this cat. You know what? I'm tired of this dude telling us what to do. He's the shot caller. I want to be the shot caller. I got life anyway. What consequences do I got? I'm just going to kill this cat. And that's what they do, man. They kill him. They will easily kill you, man. Sometimes it's your own people. A lot of times it's your own people. You've heard some of the interviews that we've done. What's the number three way to die in prison? I don't know. Going in the cell with the wrong person, man. How about that? How many dudes been to prison and been like, damn, bro, I don't really want to go in a cell with this kid. Sometimes you go in a cell. You might be going to the shoe. You heard my interview with the Nazi lowrider with Jimmy. Didn't necessarily want to be sellies with Jimmy, but eventually we became friends. Things worked out, but things don't always work out like that. And this isn't federal prison I'm going to read about, but we'll get to a killing in federal prison with a celly too. Get into a couple federal prisoners that you don't want to be sellies with. The convicted killer shared the same cell at Cochran State Prison, but on the morning of March 9, 2009, only one was still alive. Jamie Usana, 31, had decapitated and dissected the body of his cellmate, Louis Romero, 44, with a makeshift knife state document show. But after prison guards made their rounds, they reported that both men were alive, according to two new reports on California prisons from the Inspector General's office. The reports had fresh revelations and raised more questions about one of the most heinous slayings inside the California prison system. The killing has prompted investigations and a lawsuit over why Romero was in a cell with Usama, a self-styled satan Satanist with a history of attacking his cellmates. Let's rewind that. Boop, 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 boop. With a history of attacking his cellmate. They bring you to the door. They tell him to cuff up. You're going in. You're going to be his celly. What are you thinking right now? Dude's blasted out with ink, tattoos all over his face. Can't turn around and say no. Because then you're hit. Then you did something wrong. Something against prison politics. You refused to celly. You refused to go into a cell. He was convicted of second-degree murder after fatally shooting a woman in Compton when he was a teenager and associating with gang members. He was nearing parole eligibility. Damn, man. 27 years in prison, right? Getting ready to go before the parole board. They throw you in a cell with Usana. And here it is, man. Your blood's left on the razor wire. His new cellmate, Usana, was serving a life sentence for the killing and torture of Yvette Pena, 37, at a Bakersfield motel in 2011. With face tattoos and a flair for Charles Manson-like satanic antics, he became a dark figure during the 2017 trial, mocking the victim's family and bragging to a television news reporter of his love of torturing people. 
Sometime in the early hours of March 9, 2019, Usano methodically tortured and killed Romero. Authorities said, tortured him, man. Tortured him in a cell. There was no way to get out. Sometimes you could be the toughest, baddest dude in the prison, man, and still end up dead. Using a razor-style blade attached to a handle, Usana disfigured Romero, cutting out one of his eyes. Man, should I keep reading this? Whew. Chopping off one of his fingers, removing part of his ribs, and slicing out, out part of his lung. He ultimately cut off his head. He also pulls the body. Slicing Romero's face open on either side of his mouth to resemble an extended smile, according to an autopsy. Guards found Usana wearing a necklace made of Romero's body parts. <laughs> Usana had never had a cellmate until Romero arrived two days earlier. During his stint in a Kern County detention facility, he had been found with hatchets and other weapons and was deemed a high-risk staff assault of threat to guards, according to the lawsuit. In one incident, Usana found his way into another inmate's cell where he stabbed and slashed his face, resulting in 67 stitches. The lawsuit says when prison officials requested to photograph the inmate's injuries, he declined, knowing that he didn't want to risk Usana getting copies of the photos and adding them to his collection of trophies, court records show. So what do you learn right there, man? You don't want to go in a prison cell with a guy like that. This is a way to die. I've seen plenty of people kill their prison cellies, man. This is part of being a drug dealer. This is part of, you know, robbing people. This is part of robbing banks. This is part of carjacking. Hell, this could be part of, you know, doing white collar crimes and stealing people's money. You don't never know who you're going to end up in a cell with. Tell you a little story about Alan Stanford, the guy that stole all that money. He was a billionaire. He ended up with 110 years. Remember Alan Stanford came across the news? Not, nah, probably about what, 2010, 11, 12, somewhere in that area. I was in prison with him. People wanted his money. They wanted what he had. They beat him so bad he had to have plastic surgery done to his face in a county jail in Texas. January 2009, USP Lee. Two guys from D.C., they're living together. Dude's already in prison at the age of 20. Got sentenced to life in prison. He's got life. What is he worried about? He ain't got to worry about nothing, right? I got life, man. If I get mad at my cellie, I'll just kill him. What else can they do to me? I don't know. Maybe they can give you the death penalty. But maybe the death penalty ain't so bad to some of these guys that got life that came to prison when they were 20 years old. So killing you means nothing, man. Let me read you some of it. In an unusual case... And I was at this prison when this happened. It was in Big Sandy, January 2009, shortly thereafter I ended up leaving. In an unusual case, a federal inmate faces a possible death sentence. If convicted of killing a fellow, fellow prisoner at a high-security prison tucked away in the Appalachian region of eastern Kentucky. The U.S. Justice Department is weighing, weighing whether to seek execution for 31-year-old John Travis Milner if a jury convicts him attack, of attacking 35-year-old Vincent Earl Smith Jr., while both were housed at United States Penitentiary Big Sandy in January 2009. Milner is scheduled for arraignment September 26 in federal court in Ashland on two murder charges. Murder by a federal inmate serving life imprisonment and first-degree murder. He is serving a life sentence without parole for using a high-powered rifle to shoot a person on New Year's Eve in 2002 in Washington, D.C. And he shot like some old lady or some old, old man. He was 20 years old and got life. This dude's the dude that could be your celly. You want to be sellies with this guy? Or how about that other cat, Usuna? Well, we talk a lot of shit out here, but I tell you what, play a lot of games, but I ain't going to play that game. I wouldn't be going in a cell with Usuna. <laughs> and anybody, you know, we can talk prison politics and all that shit, but man, man I don't know, man. I might have went in a cell with him right away and just took off on him, right why the cops were there. You call it check and move, call it what you want, but I know Usuna ain't going to be using my fingers and my ears and making a necklace out of him. Go ahead, it's all right to smile once in a while. Prosecutors say Milner attacked Smith at the prison in Inez, Kentucky with a homemade ice pick. Homemade ice pick before strangling him to death. Stabs the shit out of him, then strangles him. Make sure he's, he wanted to make sure he was dead. Beyond that, details of what sparked the conflict between the two men, both from Washington, are sketchy in court records. The prison is about 140 miles east of Lexington and 321 miles west of Washington. Milner's attorney, Patrick Nash of Lexington, said his client will plead not guilty. Nash said that because of the charges and possible death sentence, a negotiated plea is unlikely. I'm not sure if they ended up killing this cat, man. I'm not sure. They may have. 
They may have killed him. Well, not killed him yet, but he might be on death row. I'm going to have to check. But, man, that's, that's another way to die in prison, man. Your life could be gone at the blink of an eye because of the dude that they put you in a cell with. Top five ways to die. So what are they? Getting drunk, number one, right? Number two, gang shit, man. Gang situations, gang shit. A lot of times, man, you can end up murdered, end up dead in prison. The third, your celly. You don't want to end up in a cell with a dude that's just, <laughs> that's, that's out of his mind, right? You could end up in a cell with people like John Powers. Remember I talked about John Powers in one of the videos? The guy that cut his fingers off? He bit his fingers off, man. Cut his testicles out. Tattooed his whole face with a razor blade and an ink pen. Screwed a hole in his head with a battery that he turned into a drill bit. He just kept drilling into his head. Is that the guy you'd want to live with? If he don't care about himself, if he can bite his fingers off, what can you do to him? He bit his fingers off, man. Showed me one of them in a pill bottle. Can you believe that? I was the only dude that would go in a wreck cage with him, and the cops thought I was absolutely not nuts. But he was from my he was from my area. He was from Syracuse, New York. He's out now, out among the living. Google him, John Powers, federal inmate, ADX. He's the reason they did the lawsuit because of what they did to him. They destroyed him mentally and emotionally. You don't want to end up in a cell with John Powers and he's having a nightmare, do you? It's part of being a drug dealer, man. The BOP don't give a shit who they put you in with. Obviously, in California, they didn't care about this guy's history. Don't you think that dude should not have been in population? Don't you think he should have been cell alone, wreck alone? Nobody should be locked in a cell with that cat. But you could possibly be in a cell with him. So it ain't just about going to prison, man. There's bigger consequences than just going to prison. Be careful. Overdose deaths. I think this is number four, and I'm going to tell you why. I see numerous dudes overdose on K2. I'm going to give you an incident in Raybrook. These dudes are smoking K2 in their cell. A couple Hispanic brothers from California area. They're smoking K2. It's, you know, lock in. As soon as they lock in for the, for the evening, 9 o'clock, they get locked in. Cop does his little rounds. They decide to get high. They'll be doing a 10 o'clock count here soon, but they're going to get high real quick before the cop comes around. These cats get high. They're smoking deuce. They're both on the ground when the cop's doing the round. And this cop ended up leaving the job shortly after this. I hear the cop get to their cell. He says, holy fuck, they're dying. They're choking to death. These dudes are laid out on their back puking and so comatose off K2 that they're choking on their own vomit. Overdose deaths are real, man. You know, I seen a dude in New York State Prison. When I was in New York State Prison, he was sitting in his bed, shot some heroin up, and he died right there sitting there. And I remember walking to chow, breakfast, he was dead. Then I remember going to lunch, he was still dead. They just had a chain with a padlock wrapped around his cell, locked. We're walking by and we see this dead dude, man. He's just sitting there. He's been there six, seven hours until the authorities could get in there and do their little investigation. They really didn't give a shit back then. I think that was in 1996. In Comstock, New York. Great metal correctional facility. Dude's dead, sitting in his bed. No one gives a shit. He overdosed. He's got a needle sticking in his arm. Cops will get here. They'll do a little investigation. They'll put him in a body bag and take him out. Overdose deaths are real. Let me read you this. And I'll probably put a picture up in the video. Donald Hudson's family had been waiting for his release from prison for decades. For decades, waiting for him to get out of jail. But in September 2018, Hudson died at Missouri Eastern Correctional Center after taking the illegal drug, K2. St. Louis Public Radio first reported on his death last year as part of a long-term investigation examining overdoses in Missouri prisons. Our reporting uncovered disturbing details about the night Hudson died, spurring more questions. His official cause of death was a K2 overdose, according to a toxicology report, but an internal investigation by the Missouri Department of Corrections revealed that officers improperly restrained Hudson while he was overdosing. They used extra force on him and they killed him, said Tasha Franks, Hudson's sister. I'm just so angry. This is something we'll never forget. The Missouri Department of Corrections, like other state prison systems in the U.S., has struggled to keep K2 and other drugs out of its facilities. But illicit drugs continue to infiltrate Missouri prisons, resulting in a steady stream of inmate overdoses. K2, known as a synthetic cannabinoid, 
often consists of plant material laced with a combination of chemicals. The chemical cocktail and concentration vary from batch to batch, making it particularly dangerous for users. Users can experience seizures, elevated heart rate, and even psychosis. Some of these dudes are smoking bug spray, man. When I was in Kentucky, you know, I heard dudes talking about this shit, man. They, they were spraying bug spray on paper, and these little pieces the size of an eyelash were comatose and dudes, man, just knocking dudes off their feet. Dudes are overdosing all over the country. You can you can look at it. You can pull it up. It's it's going on, man. It's been going on. You can definitely pull that up and just look and see, man. It's just it's a there's a pandemic, man. This is the new crack. This is the new crack for federal prisoners, man. That's what federal prisoners are doing. They're getting high on that bullshit. And they're jeopardizing their life. Yeah, I'm gonna put a picture up of him. I'm gonna put some pictures up in the video. Would you wanna die like that? Would you wanna die in prison? Let me read this. Die getting high. You spent decades of your life in prison. You're getting high. Cops are restraining you. And you end up dead. Cody Umfress, a former lieutenant at Missouri Eastern Correctional Center, was not on duty when Hudson overdosed. Still, he estimates he saw at least 50 inmates high on K2 over a three-year period. They're not in control of their bodies. Their arms are flailing around. They're stumbling around like they're drunk. They can be acting extremely violent to staff and other inmates. Let's get another one. 40 overdoses in California resulted from single events at the Mule Creek State Prison in April 2018. Four women were arrested for sending the K2 into the prison, Sieber said. Had five inmates overdose over there. All five inmates who overdosed survived, Sieber said. They survived, but not everybody, uh, not everybody's as fortunate. Medical staff administered naloxin, which is used to reverse opioid overdoses, and the inmate regained consciousness, Sieber said. The effectiveness of the naloxin implies the K2 could have been laced with an opioid. K2 in its liquid form is difficult to detect because it's colorless and odorless. This made it easy for the substance to be sprayed on the mail and get through security. No correctional officers are suspected of having any involvement in letting the drugs into the prison. No, of course not. They just arrested, um, well, not just, about two years ago. They arrested the cook at Big Sandy. He was bringing in K2 and heroin and all kinds of other shit. They're talking about giving him a 17-year sentence. I don't know if he's been sentenced yet. But staff doesn't do things like this. Why would they, right? Yeah, right. Number four way to die in prison. I don't give a shit if you're in state prison or federal prison. In my perspective, is drug overdoses, man. I've seen it. I've seen it. How else do people die? Let's not forget this one, man, because this is an important one. Magli medical negligence. <laughs> medical is a joke in prison. No one gives a shit, man. To me, that's where they send the 90% uh, of the cast-offs. The people that couldn't make it out here in the public sector, they go into prison, and now they're the doctors at the prison. They're the nurses at the prison. And like I said before in other videos, I think these people are taught to hate prisoners. All prisoners are pieces of shit. You should hate them. I mean, as nasty as you can. I've been in prisons where even the chaplain was nasty. Like they teach people to be nasty. So when you're you know, an old man or you've got a medical emergency. You think they give a shit? I was in uh, Raybrook with this guy. Um, allegedly, he was a Zeta gang member in Mexican cartel. Falls off his bunk, hits his head, busts his head open. He's bleeding. Sally's kicking the door. This really happened. It wasn't a fight. This dude really fell down, hit his head, bleeding all over the place. He was kicking his door, man. At two in the morning. They never came to get the cat till 3.30 in the morning. Busted his head wide open, blood everywhere. They don't give a shit. Medical negligence. You want to talk about a federal medical center? Lexington, Kentucky. I used to go up on their, on their medical floor and talk to these old men. Tried to help them out when compassionate release got started. Because you have to fill out a compassionate release request with the facility, with the warden first. These dudes couldn't even read and write. They were so far gone. There were people up there laying in their beds just waiting to die, man. How the hell could they possibly write a request to the warden? Do you think the nurses would have helped them? No. Nobody helped them. Nasty, nasty people. Nobody helped them. I went up there and I started writing them. I started writing their compassionate release motions from prison. Tupac's father was on that floor. I think I might have mentioned this before. He was uh, he was kind of like a mean dude, you know? But eventually we ended up getting along. I remember going in a room with 
couple of the brothers, man. There's this guy just laying there, man. Couldn't talk, couldn't think, couldn't couldn't do shit. I shouldn't say couldn't think, because one of the brothers asked him, he said, hey, brother, you okay? You want you want something to drink? Because it looked like he was dying of thirst, man. You want something to drink? Blink your eyes. And the dude blinked his eyes. He heard us. He wanted a drink. He was dying anyway. Nobody wanted to give him a drink. The nurses, no one. One of the homeboys gave him a drink. Dude ended up living another four or five months. But he just wanted a drink, man. And couldn't get one. No one gave a shit. Mouth dry as hell. He just wanted a drink. He couldn't talk. I've seen dudes up there in the medical ward. 30-year-old dudes, man, with cancer. I've seen a young black brother from Ohio. God bless him. I don't know if he lived or he died. I watched this man lose 100 pounds, man. Just shrivel right on up. Shrivel right on up. His family was involved, though. They came to see him. And eventually they drove him out on a on a uh, ambulance and took him back to Cleveland, Ohio, man. And that's where he went. I don't know if he lived or if he died. You got a medical issue? Very good possibility you're going to die in prison. Let's read something. The deceased Thomas M. Fitzgerald was incarcerated under the control of the federal BOP at the U.S. Penitentiary at Atlanta, Georgia at the time of his death on December 9, 1999. This is an old one. Pulled it up out of criminal legal news. Fitzgerald died while strapped to the bed by four-point restraints in an isolation cell. That's why I'm reading this one, because of the four points. We've talked about four point before. That's when they cuff this hand, cuff this hand, cuff your left leg, cuff your right leg, and they leave you there butt-ass naked, man. They leave you there butt-ass naked. You're going to piss on yourself. You're going to shit on yourself. They might bring you one of them little uh, nutrition drinks and put a straw in your mouth and let you drink it. If they want to. His death certificate indicated severe dehydration, which produced elevated blood, urea, nitrogen levels, leading to brain damage, organ failure, and death. Fitzgerald was 37 years old. Survived by a large family, including an 11-year-old daughter with cerebral palsy. His 11-year-old daughter with cerebral palsy would never have a father ever again. Why? Is this medical negligence? They strapped him to a bed. They four-pointed this dude, man. And then they never brought him anything to drink. Never brought him anything to eat. They left him there. You're helpless. You're all alone. Probably start hallucinating after a while. Praying that your mom was there to save you. You might have seen your mother in your dreams. But the one thing for certain is you're laying on this bed. Dying of thirst and no one will bring you anything. They won't even bring you a sponge. With just a little bit of wine on it. Right? Yeah. Referring to Jesus. Let's read this one. Eva Lucky, a prisoner at Rikers Island, New York jail for petty larceny, died in April 2002 because of negligence on the part of jail staff to provide her with the prescription medication needed to control her asthma and failed to perform CPR on her when she went into a respiratory distress. Medical negligence. She's in a respiratory distress. She can't breathe. No one's there to help her. If they are, they're looking at her like, huh. you have no idea how many articles I wrote for criminal legal news and prisoner's legal news where the nurses just said, huh. He's faking. He's not going through a withdrawal from heroin. Oh, he's not really hurt. Here you go. I got a good one for you. USP Lee. This brings us back to medical negligence and gangs, cars, Native Americans. Two Native American brothers are going to go send this other brother up top. What does up top mean? It means they're going to send this guy to protective custody. If they're threatening him, you got to get off the yard. We don't want you here. Your ass is out of here. So they go into a unit. They say, hey, man, your ass is out of here. The dude bucks the system. This man ain't going nowhere, man. Remember that dude at USP Lee when they wanted to send him up top, Lair Dog? Dude got hit in the chest and died. Gang violence, another way to die being in a gang. Getting ready to go home, wants to be a tough guy, gets stabbed in the heart. Jumps back, puts his hands up, and he dies. USP Lee. A lot of deaths there. These guys go to send this dude up top. Dude refuses. The two homeboys now. Let's say it's me and you, me and you, and we're sending Billy up top. I swing the knife at Billy. Billy moves out of the way. I hit you in the neck. I hit you in the neck, man. You start bleeding, whatever. The cops come. We go to the hole. Medi medical checks you out, and they say, nah, man, you're all right. You're, we're going to put you in the hole, man. You're over there starting shit. You're good. You're all right. We, we did a medical assessment, and you're fine. 
You go to your cell, man. And that night, you die. How do you die? You bleed to death, man. You got internal bleeding. You're dead. It's over with, man. Instead of sending you out to the hospital after you get stabbed in the neck, they put you in the cell in the hole. After medical says you're good. Dude was never good, man. He needed medical help. And that's where he died, man. Blood was left on the razor wire at USP Lee. Don't take my word for it, man. Google that shit. Look it up. What year was that? 2009, 2010? Google it. Check and see if I'm lying to you or if I'm telling you the truth. The truth stands alone to represent itself. And what is that truth today? Top five ways to die in prison. What is that truth? The truth is, it's not a place you want to be, man. It's not a place you want to be. Definitely don't want to be in prison getting drunk, but so many people do it. Don't you want to be aware? Don't you want to know what's going on in a place that's filled with dudes with life sentences? With killers? Don't you think you should be aware? Awareness, man. Nope. Not some of these cats. They'd rather get drunk, blasted, start arguing, and end up dead. Somebody's got to call their mom. Gang violence. I don't have to keep talking about it. You already know it. You've seen a thousand shows. I can only tell you about it because I experienced it. It's not something I read. It's not something I made up. It's something I lived. Federal prison. That's part of being a drug dealer, man. Dying in prison is part of being a drug dealer. Dying in prison is part of, you know, being a bank robber, stealing people's money. You don't think they don't bang white collar guys. I got a friend named James Nicholson. He copped out to 40 years, man. When he was 45 years old, going to die in prison probably. No way out. Sellies. Who the hell wants to be selled with them cats, right? You can just be selled with an all right dude. You guys are locked down for 27, 28 days. You start getting on each other's nerves. Your cellie's got 10 years. He's pissed off today. Might punch you in the face, man. They don't like what it sounds like when you're pissing in the toilet. Dudes that are watching this, that been in prison, locked in a cell with someone. Nobody wants to hear you pissing, man. Makes people angry for some reason. Pisses me off, too. Pisses me off as well. But that's what it is, man. That's what it is. Med medical negligence, overdose deaths. Imagine being four-pointed and no one will help you and you're just there screaming and crying, dying of thirst for days. And they walk by you and look at you and laugh at you. Oh, the BOP will tell you that their policy is they go check on you all the time. They keep good records. Not always, man. So that's it, man. Top five ways to die in prison. Not that I hope you enjoyed the video, but I hope that you learned something. I hope that it told you, man, I don't want to do this. Maybe getting a nine to five might be a better choice, man. Because this is what's on the other side of the wall. I don't want to see you dead, man. I don't want to see your blood left on the razor wire. Blood on the razor wire TV. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. Share the video. And don't forget, leave a comment. I'll respond. With respect, until tomorrow, we're out.